So I was thinking we could start with a short reflection about metta to warm you up to the idea of practicing metta towards the whole universe or as far as your metta is willing to be spread today. And, uh, and then we could have a longer meditation perhaps um, because usually when I go through the metta, especially if we practice starting with ourselves and then going through a few various categories so that we can really build it up before we spread it, it does take a little bit of time, maybe 40 minutes or so. So how does that sound to people? Does that sound like a good way to do it? And um, if you are tired and you just want to start meditating now, please feel free um, and just consider any of these words that I offer as support for your practice. And if you find you don't need that information, you're not really in the mood to, to hear more and to try to take it in, just let it wash over you. It's fine. You know, it's not important. And the important bits always somehow get in there. They get into your heart. They resonate, you know. They guide you where you need to be guided. So I think it's an intuitive thing when we listen deeply, when we listen with our whole body, not only with our head, but maybe centering your awareness, if you wish, anywhere in the body that feels fairly pleasant, fairly easeful. Maybe, you know, if you want to keep your eyes open, that's fine, but just keeping some connection with the sense of being embodied. Yeah, How does it feel to have a body? How does it feel to be a sentient being who can feel, yeah? a tactile being who has sensations, who has feelings, maybe stickiness, heat, weight, pressure, yeah? maybe tingling, maybe throbbing or aching, tiredness, lethargy, whatever it is, just contacting that at the level of sensations as you listen. So I'll just go through a short reflection on loving kindness and we are calling this session the wisdom of love. I've probably done one before with the same <laughs> with the same name, who knows. Um, but hopefully something different will come out or you'll pick up something different whenever you hear the Dharma talks. So metta is traditionally known as loving kindness, sometimes benevolence, which is a really beautiful translation. Um, and it's usually translated as benevolence when it's expressed as non-ill will, avyapada. I think that's a beautiful um, way of talking about it. Some people like to translate it as loving friendliness rather than loving kindness. A kind of attitude of befriending yourself and the entire world. And also just a sense of goodwill, you know, that you wish somebody well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a feeling of warmth or friendship in a personal way, but a feeling of goodwill. You want the best for that person. And perhaps sometimes that can mean telling that person something that's maybe painful to say. Maybe you know it might hurt them, but perhaps on what, you know, balancing things up, you might feel it is for their good, you know, to pull out of a difficult situation or to just change the way they're behaving so that they're more on track with goodness and so that the wholesome qualities can increase. So metta is not just sort of fuzzy, lovey-dovey, whitewashing or sugarcoating our experience, not at all. I think it actually has um, a lot of uh, respect also for ourself and for our own boundaries, yeah? So it's unconditional in the sense that it doesn't depend on us liking a person, right? It's, uh, it doesn't expect anything in return or demand anything in return. <clears throat> and it's also impartial, the way that the sun shines, on everything impartially as long as there's no shadows right <laughs> the sun will shine on the weeds in the same way that it shines on the flowers <clears throat> and the word apamana is very beautiful because it literally means um, immeasurable and I think a practical way to understand and interpret that is um, the aspect of not measuring not measuring oneself not measuring others again not trying to weigh things up or holding people in debt you know holding people to ransom and also this sense of boundlessness, that it can spread to include it all, to include all beings. And the first way that I think there's a lot of wisdom in loving kindness is because we have to learn to understand that hatred is never overcome by hate, as the Buddha said, but by love alone is it overcome. So just this simple understanding sets us on the right track. And it's starting to really... Um, work on or let undermine the hindrance of ill will, which is a huge problem for everybody. 
And ill will um, also has the aspect of fear. Fear is on the side of dosa, do, um, not wanting, you know, kind of withdrawing from experience, reacting to experience in a negative way. And in the suttas it's often used as an antidote to fear as well as to ill will. And also I think it's important to recognise the wisdom of having a heart of love in relationship to others, you know, and in relationship to how we view the world. Learning to see people through kindly eyes, learning to highlight their qualities rather than focus on their faults. Yeah. And you do this not for their benefit as much as for your own, because again, when you harbour any resentment or anger, it just eats away at you. It undermines your resources, you become tired and weary and kind of ragged and miserable, and the whole world looks you know, unpleasant whenever we have ill will and anger. You know, Everything that's wrong in your life kind of seems to get uh, magnetically drawn to that mind state, you know, and we just uh, increase our ill will and our negativity that way. So when we have this beautiful way of relating to people or seeing people, reflecting on their goodness, you know, reflecting on the good fortune of knowing each other, it's so easy for me sitting with you all here, you know, reflecting on the ways that our paths have come in contact and the beautiful times that we've shared, even if it's only been, you know, through Zoom or maybe through a few Oxford Insight sessions where we used to meet in person, it's still very powerful and that can really come through when we actually get together. You know, like we did the other day in the park, a few of us just had a cup of tea. And uh, and it was so beautiful to find that even those among us who had never met each other seemed to resonate on a very similar energetic frequency. And there was a sense of trust, there was a sense of harmony there. And so that metta, that loving kindness, that positive way of regarding each other came out in our speech, the way we spoke to each other, you know, the way we listened respectfully to one another's sharings and stories. And I really felt able to express some of my journey, you know, some of the more difficult parts, which are not always easy to discuss, because I felt safe, I felt accepted there, I felt unjudged, you know. And so this is how metta creates community, it creates harmony. And it's also a way to um, regard our meditation when we use metta as a way of relating to our inner world. You know, we can relate to our meditation as a way to improve ourselves and get rid of a sort of uh, things that we don't like about ourselves, or we can relate to the practice as a way to embrace every aspect of ourselves, to embrace and understand what's happening rather than to judge. You know, it's also, I like Adrian Brown's way of talking about it, a very kind of pithy little sentence that metta is simply opening the door of your heart. Yeah. Opening the door of your heart to others, to what arises, to your body, to your experience with the breath. Opening the door of your heart, or opening the door, if you like, of your mind yeah, to all of that. And welcoming it, welcoming it in with friendliness, with loving kindness, with kindly eyes. And I think it's also you know, an aspect of why we become wise through the meta practice, and it's wise to practice loving kindness is because it helps us develop wholesome states. Yeah? So it cultivates the flowers, if you like, the beautiful, pure qualities, the beneficial qualities that lead us out of suffering, and keeps away the weeds. Yeah? In this case, when we're practicing loving-kindness as a formal practice, we're cultivating calm, we're cultivating you know, a sense of ease and well-being, and also it has this very special quality of being pleasant. So we're actually learning to get a taste for the wholesome kind of happiness that leads out of sensuality, away from the coarser forms of happiness that exacerbate craving and lead to clinging, grasping, possessing, and to a more pure, refined kind of happiness that gives us a taste already of what it's like to be free. The happiness that frees the mind from burdens and that wells up from within. It's not so dependent on external conditions. And then we can start to spread that loving kindness in all the directions, yeah? And in one of the suttas it says that when we do this and we spread it extensively, no limiting comma remains there. It's almost as though it's impossible for the effects of maybe more unwholesome acts that we may have done in the past to arise there because the mind is so expansive, so great, mahagata, it's gone to greatness. 
And so, you know, even if an unpleasant thought arises, it barely has an impact. Sometimes it can't even take hold in the first place in the mind. So we're actually undermining any negative karma and me, it, making it so that it won't have an impact on the mind. <clears throat> There's another um, beautiful sutta called the Salt Crystal, or the, I think it's the Salt Crystal Sutta, Angutra 1 something, or 3, no, sorry, Angutra 3 1, I think it is, for anyone who wants to read the suttas. But it's called the Salt Crystal, and it's quite easy to find. And it talks about the difference in having a lump of salt in a small glass of water, Right, so you put, say, the lump of salt in this case stands for unwholesome acts of body or speech and the, the karma that arises from that. Um, so you can either have that in a glass of water and the water becomes too salty to drink, or you can have it in the river Ganges and you don't even notice the salt. So the river Ganges is like the mind expanded with metta, the mind gone great. If you're full of loving kindness, then whatever niggling, trifling, bad karma you've performed will hardly have any impact at that time. So this is really one of the wisdom practices that I find most helpful with metta, just seeing that nothing is actually fixed and that in this present moment we have the capacity to determine our future and actually to lead us in a much more wholesome direction, out of suffering and towards liberation, freedom, transcendence of all this karma that we may have made. If it wasn't possible to transcend karma, then we'd be stuck, because there'd be no end of having to experience the results of our deeds, good or bad, right? And then another important part um, is, is the wisdom itself that arises through deep practice of metta, and I think this is especially the case where the metta becomes really deep and can actually lead us into states of jhana, samadhi. And for me, one of the most important things to notice is how the process of letting go and allowing this loving kindness to fill the mind, to fill the heart, leads to joy. And the more we let go, the more we relinquish the sense of self. Increasingly subtle aspects of the sense of self, like the bit that wants to know what's happening, the bit that wants to control or assess, the more we relinquish that, the more happy we feel. Mm -hmm. And this is really going in the opposite way of the world, because in the world we're taught that the more we want, the stronger our sense of self, our self-esteem, if you like, the happier we'll be. And actually when we realise that we're starting to disappear, we're giving, it's almost as though we're giving an opportunity for something else to arise, for the Brahma Viharas to arise, in this case the Menta. Yeah. And also that by letting go, we're also letting go of the hindrances, again, ill will, um, craving. You don't need to crave if you're practicing metta because there's already so much pleasure there and a very beautiful kind of pleasure, a much more contented type of joy. And uh, of course, doubt is not really there because you're getting focused now. Your mind's becoming a kagata, one pointed. You're very confident in your meditation object, your subject of meditation, and the mind stays absorbed in that. Yeah, There's no restlessness there. Because the mind, again, is happy to be where it is. It doesn't need to jump to the past or the future. And as I said, also, yeah, the other one actually is the sleepiness and lethargy. And that is overcome, again, through happiness, through joy. Right? You may notice that when your mind is tired, there's less joy. Or when there's less joy, you become tired and sleepy. Right? Sometimes we actually... Um, allow ourselves to sink into sleepiness to get away from unpleasant sensations or situations. We're not enjoying our life. You know, we just go to sleep. Ajahn Brahm said he went to prisons in his um, earlier monastic life and the prisoners there used to say, an hour of sleep is an hour of your sentence. And I think it's the same with us, isn't it? We sometimes just want to zone out because we're not enjoying our life. But if the happiness starts to arise, then with that comes energy. The mind becomes bright and the mindfulness increases. And so we start to see much more. Yeah? So another way that wisdom can be derived, if you like, from metta or is an outcome of metta is that we start to see that our perception is conditioned. You know, the way we see things is not the way they are. It's not fixed. One day you might be in a grumpy mood and you'll see all the faults in your partner, all the faults in your friend. You look at your life through the perspective of like grumpy glasses, <laughs> maybe black glasses or something, brown glasses, I don't know, or dotted glasses, and you'll see all the faults in your life. 
you know, how this led to this bad thing and that led to this bad thing and that's why I feel like I do. Whereas when your mind's full of metta, it's a completely different life story. If you write your autobiography at that time, oh, this had to happen because that led to this and I met this person and isn't it all so wonderful, you know? And so which version is really true? Maybe neither. Maybe neither is actually the reality as it is because at this point we're not enlightened. But which one is most beneficial? You know, the Buddha was less concerned, I would say, and this is probably a slightly controversial thing to say, with truth than with what is for our benefit, at least in the beginning, right? At least in the beginning of the path. He was entirely concerned with our benefit. You know, he taught for the benefit and liberation of all, for the benefit and happiness of all. Out of anukampa, that means compassion, which is very closely related to loving kindness. Yeah, he was concerned with us coming out of suffering. That was the main point. And seeing the truth is part of coming out of suffering. You see the truth in order to come out of suffering. What's the point seeing the truth, or some pseudo-truth, if you're still suffering, if you're still miserable? You know, if you want to go around just arguing with everybody else. I know the right way. You're all wrong about it. Yeah, it's much more important to be kind than to be right. Yeah. Ajahn Brahmali said something very beautiful in his retreat that he did for us um, not long ago. It was an eight-day retreat online and it was absolutely wonderful. And I wrote down one quote. He said, if there's a choice between meditating and being kind, choose kindness every time. Because kindness will be the foundation on which everything else is built. You know, this is wisdom. This is really wisdom. Metta, kindness are not just preliminary things. They have to be the foundation of the whole path. And so when we have a soft mind, a mind, a mind of metta, our attention is also drawn to different things. You know, we maybe don't notice the faults in others and in ourselves so much. And I had this experience in Australia where um, there was a lot of noise actually in the roof because as the sun would come down on the kind of metal roof, it would expand and go boom, all of a sudden, sorry if you were meditating, but it would go boom, <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, and I, I, was, I was thinking, gosh, I don't know how I'm going to manage for two weeks meditating in this room when the roof keeps kind of exploding like this, but then that night I practiced some loving kindness and had quite a, a kind of opening of the heart, and the next day I meditated. And I noticed the banging in the roof, but I noticed there was no reaction at all. I was completely fine with it. And then after, like, as the retreat proceeded, and I continued to practice with, you know, I usually practice with an attitude of love and kindness, no matter what kind of practice I pick up. So I think I was mostly doing breath meditation, trying to infuse my awareness with kindness, treat the breath like a friend. And I realised that I wasn't even hearing the noise anymore. I wasn't even noticing it. So it's very interesting to see that we select things according to the state of our mind, you know. If we're annoyed, we go to the garden and we see, like, I've got Russian vines in the little courtyard. Once you see one, if you're kind of, you know, focusing on that, on that problem, you start to see them everywhere. <laughs> Whereas if you're just looking at the flowers at that time, the weeds don't exist. Mm. So it's really interesting. And, of course, another way is that you start to understand, even when you go into deeper samadhi, you have to come out eventually, right? And so you see the impermanence in those samadhi states themselves, even the most exalted states of liberation of the mind. Yeah? And I'm talking about liberation in the jhana states, not full liberation with wisdom. Um, but we can see that those samadhi states are also, to some extent, fabricated. They're conditioned, they're still not the final goal. We have to let go. They naturally fall apart. We don't even have to do the letting go of them. They just naturally um, subside when the causes um, for them to arise disappear. And then the last thing, which I found in the suttas actually, is the Anguttara 1116. I wrote down the little uh, the quote. And uh, the Buddha actually says that another way of um, learning wisdom through the practice of metta is that we notice that the Brahma Viharas are constructed and produced by volition. Yeah? And because they're constructed and produced by volition, even though far less volition, right? I mean, we're actually tuning and aligning our mind to something very beautiful, but still they're impermanent, and because they're impermanent, they're subject to cessation. And I think this gives us the impetus to use them as a sort of, not use them, but 
to understand that they are a platform to seeing things as they are. So samadhi is not a goal in itself, but it's a beautiful, beautiful and very beneficial um, thing to experience. But the reason for that is not to just stay in bliss forevermore, it's to see things as they truly are. Yeah? And this is straight from the texts. Samadhi pachaya yita bhuta jnana rasana it means samadhi is the cause for seeing things as they truly are because the hindrances are gone in those states. Yeah? So the metta takes you into those states and as a result the wisdom can deepen and you can actually have a chance to see things as they really are. In other words, in alignment with anicca, dukkha and anatta. To see that everything is changing all the time, it can't be relied upon, it's inconstant, it's subject to change, and it's subject to cessation. And to see the whole scope of dukkha, right? That even pleasant experiences are still not the same as peace. The peace of Nibbana is the highest happiness. It's very different. It's completely different from anything that we can experience in the sensual world. Mm. Or even in the realm of the mind. It's actually beyond this mind and this body. Something that's truly unconditioned, and that is our real goal. So, that was a fairly short reflection compared to my usual. (laughs) But I hope that something in there resonated in some way. And also encouraged you to practice metta meditation and uh, see what we can experience for ourselves. So again, establishing the right attitude first of all, because I've just gone from kind of the mundane benefits all the way through to enlightenment, and we're not expecting this. Metta, remember, is love without conditions, love without expecting anything in return. So we're just happy to cultivate loving kindness, because it's a way of practicing right intention, right thought, right speech, if you like, internal right speech, and developing those beautiful flowers in our heart. So every moment of loving kindness, the Buddha says, is a moment that you are practicing the path. It's powerful. It's cutting through aversion, through anger, through greed. So please get yourselves comfortable, even more comfortable than you already are, (laughs) I know that some of you are tired and you might be thinking, I'm going to fall asleep. But honestly, it's a privilege. I feel very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, It's a, what's the word? Uh, Compliment if you fall asleep during my talk. I consider that I've hypnotised you now, not really, that you've relaxed very well. And the body knows what it needs to do, the mind knows what it needs to do, so sometimes it just needs to just have a little rest. Opening the door of your heart to the tiredness, restlessness, agitation, whatever it may be. And if you find that you prefer to practice in your usual way, then please do go ahead. You can just let my words kind of flow through. Some people are able to uh, tune words out. I'm not very able to do that. But uh, hopefully you may feel like giving it a go. So as usual, when I begin meditation, I like to remind myself why I meditate not in order to gain anything, but to let go. To let go of wanting, craving, ill will. And to learn to relate to experience in a wise way, a kind way, a compassionate way.
to learn to view my body, my inner world with kindly eyes. Just see if you can establish that beautiful motivation in your mind and notice its gladdening effect. This is your good karma attitude. Intention is karma, said the Buddha. Just explore the body and the level of sensations. So that wherever your attention falls, kindness follows along with it. Relaxing any tightness, tension, holding. Especially in your face, around your brow, the temples, inviting a sense of spaciousness there. Allowing the tissues to become soft. the jaw to open slightly, the shoulders to perhaps roll back initially and then drop down. Sensing into your arms, your fingers, fingertips. Just receiving any sensations with kindness, with care. Without judgment, but with more of a sense of interest, curiosity. And this kind awareness spreads throughout your whole chest, abdomen, the area of the ribs, across your back, as though you're basking in the warm gentle sunshine, allowing everything to relax. Noticing your legs, knees, all the way down the calves to the feet and the toes, and your buttocks, don't leave them out. As though your whole body was suffused with kind awareness, like the sunshine that shines impartially 
on every part of your body. Attending to your experience with interest and with kindness. And smiling within at this being who is you. If you wish, you can offer yourself some phrases, good wishes of loving kindness. You may be used to working with the classic phrases, such as, may I be happy. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I live at peace. Just taking a few moments to find some phrases that really resonate and speak to you into your deepest wish for well-being in a harmony. Just gently, carefully repeating these phrases to yourself. Pausing between each phrase to listen to the emotional resonance that flows along with sensations in the body. Before once again planting the seeds of loving kindness with the next thought. Without demand or expectation just offering each phrase as a gift. Allowing any pleasant sensations, no matter how subtle, There's resistance, frustration, even anger arising for you. Just opening the door of your heart to that as well.
you wish you can continue in this way, well, I invite you to bring to mind a very dear person in your life. good sort of test of whether this is a suitable person for this stage of the metta practice is that they bring a smile to your heart and mind, maybe even to your face when you recall them. Someone who you don't have any a very complex relationship with. Where there's a free and easy feeling of care, goodwill, friendship and warmth. Maybe imagining this person sitting in front of you or by your side. Recollecting their beautiful qualities to invoke a sense of their presence, a sense of warmth. And offering the gift of loving kindness to this person. By adapting the phrases, or if you wish, you can continue to use the same words. Listening in the space between the phrases. To where they are inclining the mind. To the felt experience of loving kindness. Just keeping the whole process very gentle, really relaxing the mind and trusting in the power of the, your intention of loving kindness to slowly widen and soften the heart.
invite you to gently bid this friend, this loved person, farewell, smiling into their eyes. Allowing them to fade and bring to mind someone who perhaps you don't know very well. You don't have strong feelings of liking or disliking toward. This is known as the neutral person. Someone with no vested interest. There's no jealousy, resentment, no dreams with this person. Perhaps someone you barely notice. Maybe the vegetable box delivery person. Someone at work or a neighbour who you barely speak to. Just getting a sense of this person and continuing to practice in the same way. Imagine suffusing this person with good wishes, goodwill. Notice if there's any change in the quality of the loving kindness. Just notice with curiosity. to connect or become bored, you can always return to the loved person again. Just give it a try and allow the metta to gently build. If you wish, gently letting go of this person now and imagining the metta starting to flow outward, outward from your heart into this virtual Zoom room to all of us here gathered together to practice. People who you know or who may be strangers, who you regard as friends or feel fairly indifferent toward, maybe mixed feeling, just recognizing that all of us, 
wish for our own happiness and well-being. May we all be happy, truly content. May we all be safe and well. May we all find deep inner peace. May we all be free. Imagining this loving kindness filling up this virtual space like golden sunshine, suffusing everyone here, growing stronger as we share our loving kindness with each other. Soon this loving kindness becomes wider, more powerful and spreads outwards and unbounded in all directions. sensations to flow along with the intentions of loving kindness to all beings in front of you all beings to the side to the left to the right all beings behind you All beings above and below. All beings human or non-human. Far or near. visible or invisible, all beings who desire happiness and recoil from pain, may all beings be free from suffering. Find true happiness and deep inner peace. beings who come to mind to be part of this flow of loving kindness. Maybe beings who are happy, beings who are in great suffering and pain, living in troubled parts of the world living in fear or in poverty. All beings, wherever they may be, the insects, the worms, creatures who live underground, all animals, to 
domestic or wild. Those who may be endangered. All beings who live in the sky. Maybe in different realms that are beyond the naked eye. And all creatures of the sea, the rivers, the lakes. And the plant life and trees. Wherever there is life. May all beings be free from suffering. Be happy. Be peaceful. Be free. Just resting in this boundless state, or even noticing any expansion at all in your mind. Softening into the experience of wishing all beings well including yourself. Maintaining this wide perception that includes all beings. See if you can also contact your body sitting. So that you're grounded back in your body, in your room. Yourself to open up to any pleasantness at all, wholesome happiness, however subtle, which the Buddha said is to be cultivated and not to be feared. Sabedeva 
Sabay manusa Sabay winipadika Aweva hontu Abya paja hontu Aniga hontu Sukiatanam pariharantu Dukamunjantu Yatalada sampatito Maui gajantu Kamasaka So when you're ready, you may open your eyes to end the meditation. <laughs> I know some of you might want to do the big sadhu. So if you wish to, you can. Sadhu. It means awesome. <laughs> and it's very nice to end with a smile. So I hope that you enjoyed that meditation. Gave you maybe a few different ways to practice that may be useful from time to time. For myself, I think it's really um, beneficial and enriching for my practice to have various ways and methods and means because the mind is different from time to time whenever you sit down. You know, sometimes you feel that you just want to be with your body. Sometimes it might help to do a body scan and relax individual parts of the body just to ground you in the present. Other times you might want to keep your awareness very open so that whatever arises within the body or mind can be felt, can be heard. And sometimes we might notice that we do have kind of a lot of ill will or grumpiness or we just need a bit of a lift and it can be really nourishing to practice loving kindness um, as a cultivation as an object of samadhi, if you like. Um, and with my regular metta group, we are, have been going through all these categories, uh, adding a different one each week, adding an extra one each week. So we always start with ourself. And I try to establish that wise attitude towards uh, meeting the sensations, the feelings in our body and mind. Uh, metta as an attitude, as I call it. And then also metta as a cultivation, where we start to um, plant, if you like, little phrases in our mind. And it's really powerful, even if it doesn't go beyond that, even if you don't get any actual feelings or emotions of loving-kindness. At the moment you have a thought of loving-kindness, a thought of ill-will cannot coexist. And this is straight from the suttas, the Majjhima number 19, Majjhima Nikaya 19. Whenever there's a thought of loving-kindness, a thought of ill-will cannot exist. Whenever there's a thought of compassion or non-harm, non-violence, a thought of cruelty cannot exist. Whenever there's a thought of letting go, giving up, relinquishing, a thought of sensuality, sensual desire, craving cannot exist. So this is already reconditioning our minds in ways that actually starts to create or change our experience in the world. Mm -hmm. The Buddha said, whatever we frequently think about and ponder upon becomes the inclination of your mind. So the more we can have those thoughts of loving kindness, the more we start to have them spontaneously arise in our life at the most unexpected of times. So I think it's a very powerful practice and it's also helpful in overcoming unwanted thoughts that just lead you down to the dark dungeons of your mind. Yeah. So, I want to give some time for some communication, discussion, questions, comments, feedback, or whatever may need to be expressed. <laughs>